Hey, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us again uh, for this week's last webinar and also the last webinar for at least a couple of weeks. Um, so what's going to happen is that um, we will still have webinars occasionally. They just won't be as regular and as often as we've been having them. Um, and we've also got other plans and activities and, and contests coming up. So definitely keep an eye on our social media and our website. Um, but for now, I want to introduce Alexandra McIntyre. She's a PhD student at UC Davis uh, in California, and she's also a researcher for the Irish Basking Shark Group, so on my end of the pond. Um, and we, she's been studying, so she's been studying Basking Sharks, but she also studies the movement behavior and physiology of elasmobranchs in general, um, with some projects on um, six gill sharks as well, I believe, was it? Or seven gills? Seven gills, yeah. Seven gills. Um, yeah, and so today she's going to tell us all about basking sharks in Ireland and the research that she's been carrying out over here. Um, and with that, Alex, why don't you introduce yourself further and the floor is all yours. Awesome. Well, I'll just go ahead and share my screen um, really quickly. Thank you so much, Jenny. And let me just make sure I'm right here. Um, can you see that okay? Yeah. Awesome. Um, awesome. Well, I'm really excited to be here. Sharks for Kids is a really amazing organization um, and I have a lot of respect for it. So this is um, quite exciting for me to be able to speak for this webinar series. As Jenny mentioned, today I'm going to be talking about the science of Ireland's sea monsters. Um, and I'm excited to be speaking on behalf of the Irish Basking Shark Project, which I will introduce in just a little bit. Um, please ask questions, obviously. Uh, we, I will answer them at the end, or Jenny, if it's a general shark question, should be able to answer them as well. Now, who am I? Who am I that is speaking to you? Um, as Jenny mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of California in Davis. I am also a visiting researcher at Queen's University in Belfast, and so that is where I'm housed when I conduct my fieldwork in Ireland. Um, I am a, obviously a researcher with the Irish Basking Shark Project. I do a lot of their science communication and maintain the website, especially in addition to my research. I'm a National Geographic Young Explorer, so Nat Geo does sponsor some of our projects. And obviously I am very interested in science communication. I think that uh, the more we educate folks about conservation and the role of sharks in particular, um, the better off we will be and the more action we can undertake um, to conserve these species. As an aside, this is a map of all the places I have worked or am currently working so far, and I'll talk a little bit about that now. Um, but I've worked with uh, projects that have been sponsored by universities, like the ones you see at Queens and University of California. Um, but I've also worked on broader agency and government grants like the EU Interreg Grant. So prior to my time in Ireland, I took a gap year between my undergraduate degree and my PhD to get some hands-on experience studying sharks. Um, and I studied primarily at two different places. The first was in South Africa. And so there I studied great white sharks, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner. Um, that is me holding a clipboard in the bottom of that picture. And I also studied benthic or bottom dwelling species in the upper right hand corner. So that is a pajama shark um, and they are quite small um, and they are often found on the bottom of the ocean as I mentioned. I like to sit the half shark in all of the ocean because that shark looks like it's smiling. Um, but it was, it was just caught so it's probably not totally true. Then after South Africa, I went to the Bimini Shark Lab which is where I actually met Jillian who founded Sharks for Kids. Um, and here I worked on tiger sharks, as you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, but I also did some work um, on hammerhead sharks, nurse sharks, and lemon sharks. So you can see a hammerhead there in the bottom right-hand corner. Now I'm not gonna go into too much detail on these experiences because this was primarily a voluntary experience, but um, feel free to ask me any questions about this um, and feel free to ask Jenny as well. She was at Bimini Shark Lab, but we did not quite overlap. For my PhD then, in 2016, I began my work with the Irish Basking Shark Project, and I work primarily up at Mallon Head, which is in County Donegal. So that's, as you can see on the map, the very northernmost coast in Ireland. Um, Mallon Head is stunning, as you can see from that middle picture. 
And I've been going there for the last three years. This is actually going to be the first summer during my PhD that I have not been there. And so during this time, I was kind of integrated into the Irish Basking Shark Project, and I've been really excited to continue my research with them. But who is that? I think that's a really critical question. We get that question a lot right now. We are seeing basking sharks in Ireland this spring, so many folks are reaching out to us for information. The Irish Basking Shark Project is comprised of researchers like me, conservationists, so people who want to protect the animals, citizen scientists like all of you guys on this call, people without degrees, but who are very interested in science and research, and educators. So we do a lot of education and outreach, kind of like what I'm doing now. And our goals are to obviously educate people about the basking sharks in Ireland specifically. We also want to promote responsible and sustainable research. And so what I mean when I say that is we want to make sure that our projects are useful for Ireland and they're also um, able to be carried out for a long time because we want to make sure um, that the population is monitored for as long as possible. And Monitoring this endangered species requires looking at the basking sharks not only on a local scale in Ireland, but also taking that information that we see in Ireland and applying it to what we know about basking sharks globally. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but basking sharks are very highly mobile. They can travel throughout the world. Um, and so what we learn in Ireland is going to be critical to protecting them worldwide. And if you are curious to learn more about us as an organization, um, our website, that link at the bottom, will um, touch on a little bit about what we do and why we do it. Now, I love to ask this question. Um, if you have been on Sharks for Kids before, you could probably tell me a bunch of different facts about sharks. You, should, you could probably tell me that they have cartilage instead of bony skeleton. You could tell me that they have five to seven gills instead of just one. Um, you could tell me that there's a lot of diversity in sharks. Some are quite large, um, like the basking shark and whale shark, and some are quite small, like the pajama shark I showed you earlier. But generally, when people think of sharks, this is an image that comes to mind. It is a scary, mindless, man-eating monster. Um, and that is generally something that I like to talk about because I think that it's important to reverse this image, to look at what sharks are really like in order to conserve them properly. And one example is this. So this is the basking shark. This is the species that I've come to talk about today. It doesn't quite look like the Jaws image I just showed you. And yes, it does live in Ireland. So this is where I work on them. And often I get the question, you know, there are sharks in Ireland? And the answer is yes, there's actually a lot of sharks in Ireland. Um, and it's a very popular place for sharks to gather, especially at certain times of year. And some even live there year round. So a few facts about the basking shark. They are the world's second largest fish. The largest is the whale shark. Um, they feed on plankton, like those tiny copepods you see there at the bottom of the screen. Um, and so they do try to track populations of plankton um, as they travel throughout the world. So they filter feed, they are filter feeders. Um, and so in this picture above, that's a shark with, with its mouth open and its gills expanded. And so it is filtering water through its mouth um, and then it will eventually swallow and trap all of the plankton that came through with the water. They are highly mobile, as I mentioned. So they are found all over the world in temperate or cold waters. So we have them here in California as well. Um, and we have them up in Canada. And of course, they're very, very abundant, especially right now in Ireland, Scotland, and the UK. So those are very popular basking shark areas. And they were first classified as vulnerable by the IUCN in 1996. And so the IUCN is an organization that basically classifies every species based on what we know about how well its population is doing and what kind of threats that population is facing. And so vulnerable means essentially that the basking sharks do face some threats, but the population was not in immediate danger. That was in 1996. Last year, they were considered globally endangered. Um, so this is a globally endangered species now. Um, basking sharks have been historically fished for their liver, their meat, um, and they've also been caught as bycatch in other fishermen's nets who are trying to target other fish. I and mean, actually in Ireland, there was the best recorded and largest basking shark fishery along the Western coast, which is actually an area where I'm hoping to study. Um, so one of the, again, the largest basking shark fishery was in Ireland in the middle of the 20th century. Um, they caught 
roughly 9,000 individuals and did not stop fishing until 1984. Um, and so the population does not seem to have recovered. As a fun fact, I also work on studying basking sharks here in California, and I've taken a look at the Canadian data sets as well. In the middle of the 20th century, basking sharks were so abundant, there were so many of them in Canadian waters that they were caught in salmon nets. And the salmon fishermen would have to cut them out and lose the salmon. And so the Canadian government called for a total eradication of the species. So basically they went out with boats um, and killed many of them so that they would no longer get caught in the salmon nets. And frankly, the population in Canada hasn't recovered at all. So they are considered vulnerable, or sorry, endangered now everywhere. But in Ireland, especially, the population seems to be on the up, but we aren't sure exactly how well the population is doing relative to what it used to be. This is also my favorite fact about basking sharks. Um, it's Jenny's favorite fact as well, I think. So basking sharks breach. They actually throw themselves out of the water much like whales. Um, so this background picture you see is of a basking shark breaching um, at my field site in Mallon Head. This was taken by my collaborator in the Irish Basking Shark Project. And actually when I was on the water my first year, uh, I saw 30 breaches, so 30 sharks jumping out of the water over the course of just two hours. And it's really, really incredible. Interestingly, this is a behavior very similar to what great whites will do when they're ambushing their prey. So I'm sure many of you have heard of air jaws, but when the sharks, great white sharks will basically come up from below to hunt their seals, um, to ambush them so they don't see them when they're coming. Um, and basking sharks can actually reach speeds that are equal to that of great white sharks when they're hunting. So when they're both breaching out of the water, they reach very similar speeds, which is really, really interesting because most people think of basking sharks as being very slow moving. We still don't know why they do this. So they're possibly ridding themselves of parasites or maybe it's a social display um, where some individuals are demonstrating their dominance to other sharks in the areas. So this jumping could actually be a form of shark communication. Now I wanna talk a little bit about basking shark movements because this is primarily what I study. And we don't know too, too much about basking sharks generally. Um, what we do know about their movements tends to be at a large scale. So we tend to be able to track sharks uh, over the course of months, um, over the course of several hundred kilometers, instead of just these fine scale movements, which I'll talk about in a minute. So for example, a shark that was tagged by the Irish Basking Shark Project off the coast of Ireland um, was seen again, I think a few hundred days later, along the eastern coast of the United States. So the shark was tagged, as you can see in these top pictures, um, with a visual ID tag, and it was spotted again um, on the eastern coast of the United States by an underwater photographer. And so these tags have numbers on them, and so we know that they're ours, and the photographer got in touch with us. Um, and so that's what we call a transatlantic movement, where they're moving across the entire Atlantic, and that is pretty common for them to do. Um, so usually we see sharks um, along coastlines, the basking sharks specifically, and so at certain times of year they will disappear from the coastlines, and people used to think they were hibernating, um, but now we know that's not true. Instead, they are traveling globe potentially um, during times when we're not seeing them. So actually populations along the east coast of the United States have traveled down to Brazil as well, so they are capable of crossing the equator. Um, and sharks tagged up in the northeast Atlantic, where you see this box right here, um, have also been found down in Africa. So they are capable of these massive movements, which is really, really cool. But again, at certain times of year, like this spring, um, they do gather in what we call basking shark hotspots. So hotspots are basically aggregation or gathering areas. That's just how we classify them. Um, and they are pretty consistent. So up in this map, you can see basking shark hotspots um, along the coast of Scotland and the rest of the UK. And those red hotspots you see are actually the areas where I'm doing my PhD research. So that top uh, spot is Malin Head, the picture I showed you earlier. And then that left-hand red dot is um, my field site on Ackle Island, which is actually where the sharks used to be fished. So that's where I'll be doing some of my work as well. So they do gather in these locations at predictable times of year. And when they're in these places, they're not only feeding, we do see feeding behavior, but we also see behaviors like what you see here on your screen, which is two individuals exhibiting parallel swimming behavior. 
So the sharks will sort of coordinate their behaviors when they're in these locations and swim together. Um, and a lot of what we are hoping to do is figure out what might be going on. Is it courtship? Are they trying to mate? Or is it just that they're social? Maybe they just wanna be around other sharks. And that is something I do hope to look into for my PhD. I'm happy to discuss shark sociality at any time if anyone wants to learn about why sharks might be social. Um, but for now, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to basking sharks specifically. All right, so I've told you what I'm interested in looking at, which is their, their behaviors in these hotspot areas, right? That's, that's what I'm focusing on for my PhD. But how do we do this? How do we study basking sharks? I get this question a lot. Well, a really cool way we do this is using cameras. And so we will be out in a rib, which is a small boat, um, and you will approach the sharks from behind and get in just before their eyes. So we tend to not want them to see us because they might flee. So we'll come up behind them and then we will use a pole from the boat and attach a clamp to the fin for cameras. Um, as you can see in the bottom right hand picture. And the type of images we might get looks something like this. So this is a basking shark feeding. You can tell that its gills are expanded. So it is actively filtering water through those gills. And so from a lot of our camera footage, we see them feeding in hotspot areas, which tells us that these hotspots are really good feeding locations. And we also capture other types of behaviors like social interactions. So this is a good example of one. In this case, the shark is turning left. Its gills are closed. It's not feeding, but it tends to follow this individual. And it does this for about eight times throughout a three hour video. This is what we call nose to tail following behavior. It's thought to potentially be courtship again for mating. Maybe it's a female following a male or vice versa. But in 2019, there was actually a paper that came out that showed that the two females were following each other. So potentially it's just some sort of social behavior or maybe one shark is trying to figure out where it wants to forage or eat. So it follows the other individual. That's something we still don't know. So that's something again, we're hoping to look into. But it's very cool footage. And then I should say, while cameras are useful to us as researchers, they're also really useful when they're submitted by other folks. So we like to take advantage of footage that normal folks who are walking around will take. So this is drone footage that was submitted by John Joyce and it was taken on Ackle Island um, in May of 2019. And so here you can see the shark is feeding because its, its mouth is open, its gills are wide. So it's very useful for showing feeding behavior, but cameras can also reveal social behavior as well. So here the sharks are feeding, which indicates that this is a really good area to eat if you can tell their mouths are open, but they're also kind of following each other around. So it's really interesting to consider why they're interacting in certain locations. Are they together because it's just a great place to eat, right? You go to a restaurant because it's a good place to eat. And there might be other people there, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be interacting with them. Is that the case here in Ireland in these hotspots? Or are they attracted to these locations because there are other people there, like a house party? You want to go see other people. Um, and so that, again, is something that we are looking into actively. So again, these are kind of the two hypotheses for why or reasons why we think the sharks might be interacting. First, it's a good feeding ground. Second, it could be mating or social interactions. I should add that mating has never actually been observed in this species. Um, and so we are still trying to figure out where their mating grounds and pupping grounds where they give birth might be. Now, in addition to cameras, um, other tools we will use are called tags. And so when I talk about tags, I'm basically referring to any of many devices that can record information about the shark's movement and behavior. So there's a lot of different types of tags. Um, but they tend to be deployed on basking sharks in a very similar way. So um, as you can see in the, right, uh, the left-hand picture, um, we will tag them from the boat. So we will use that, um, that pole and we will inject a tag just underneath the cartilage, underneath their skin, kind of like an ear piercing. 
there's, as I mentioned, there's different types of tags and the ones that we use right now um, in some cases are called ultrasonic telemetry tags. Telemetry tags basically send out signals, sound signals that humans actually can't hear, but travel very well underwater. So they send out these signals and allow us to figure out where they are. Active tracking is a method we use when the ultrasonic tag sends out a signal every second. So we can put a tag on a shark, as you see on the right-hand side. And then we have a listening device on the boat called a receiver. And so we can put the receiver over the side of the boat underwater and listen for the signal by rotating the receiver back and forth. And then based on where the signal is the strongest, we will follow the shark. And we can follow the shark for several hours this way. And it's a really good way to get an idea of what the shark is doing on a minute by minute basis, right? So looking at behaviors, looking at whether they're diving or not, um, even just within the course of a day. That's obviously a very work intensive method of looking at shark behavior. So it takes a lot of effort. Passive tracking on the other hand is when those listening devices, those receivers are placed on the seafloor in areas where we think the sharks might go. So we can put a bunch of listening devices on the seafloor, and as soon as a shark that is tagged with an ultrasonic telemetry tag, remember those tags that send out sound signals, comes into the area, um, we can actually, like the, the receiver will detect it. And so that tells us basically whether the shark is in the area or not. So if we can detect the individual, it means it's returning to the area. And this is really useful for looking at whether the sharks are present over longer periods of time. So for example, if we have the listening devices in the water for a few years, um, we can get an idea of whether the sharks are coming back, the same sharks every year. Um, these listening, or I'm sorry, these transmitters, the tags, will be sending out individual ID codes. So instead of pinging every second here, they're sending out a special individual ID code. So not only will we know if sharks are in the area if we detect them, but we'll know which ones they are. And my personal favorite are called chat tags. So basically chat tags are a listening device and a transmitter in one. And so for example, if I put a chat tag on that tagged shark in the middle, it can listen for other tagged sharks around it. So for example, if I see this green shark, which is tagged, sends out an individual signal and it's close to the middle shark, then I should be able to hear that signal using the chat tag. And the longer those two sharks are associating, the longer they're close together, the more detections I will have of that green shark from the middle shark. So that's a little bit complicated. I'm happy to talk about that more, but basically chat tags are a really good way of looking at whether certain individuals like to associate with other individuals over time. So do they prefer one individual or the other? Do they prefer the green shark over the other two? Um, and that's the technology I hope to use next year. ID tags. So these are a very cost effective way um, of looking at shark movement and habitat use. So they're not crazy complicated. Um, the other transmitters are a little bit more high tech, but ID tags are very, very useful um, for operating on a budget and also involving of everyone from researchers to citizen scientists to kids in our research. Um, and so the ID tags here are the ones with numbers on them. You can see those rectangles with numbers on them. And we can deploy them on a shark, as I showed you before. And they can stay on for a pretty long time. But what's really interesting is that anyone out on the boat, if they see a shark with this number on it, can report it to us. And that tells us where the shark has gone. So a really good example of this is this is a, foot, uh, this is a picture that was submitted this year, actually, a few weeks ago of a shark that had a tag on it, a visual ID tag. Um, and this woman was actually not able to get the number, but was able to tell us, hey, one of your tagged sharks that you tagged a few weeks ago is now up north. Um, and that's really interesting and very cheap way of looking at where they're going. So if you ever are out on a boat and see a shark with a tag on it, um, not only for our project, but probably for others, because these are very commonly used, please try to see the number and let us know because that would be really useful data to have. We also do a lot of environmental monitoring for our work uh, when we are out looking for the sharks. And that is because again, we are trying to figure out what's bringing them to these hotspot areas, right? Is it just a really good place to eat? So is there a lot of plankton? As you can see in the left, that's a picture of a plankton sample. 
Um, or is it potentially the temperature is really optimal for them? Is it really good season for them to be there? Is, is the water warm enough and not too, not too warm, not too cold? Um, so we will take a lot of different uh, types of samples, as you can see on the right, um, using computers and different sensors to try to understand why the sharks are in the area, if not to associate with each other. And finally, we are conservation advocates here at the Irish Basking Shark Project. And what that means is that we do our best to make sure that basking shark threats are limited. So we try to protect them as much as we are able to in Irish waters. And I should add that even though they are endangered, um, basking sharks are not protected in Ireland. Now, this footage has been going around the internet. Um, I'm gonna pause it really quickly. This footage has been going around the internet. It's been featured on Irish news. It's very, very cool, right? It's very cool to see these animals up close and personal. And to his credit, Tom, who submitted the footage and is in this image, um, reported this sighting and told us that the sharks had swum up to him um, and they did try to remain as far away from the sharks as they could in order to film them. Um, this is not uncommon. We often get reports where people are in the water with the sharks, but we do like to use this as an opportunity to review the code of conduct around basking sharks, but it's also something to consider for other shark species if you are interacting with any sort of wildlife. So because basking sharks are not protected in Ireland, we had to borrow this code of conduct um, from the Shark Trust. So they are protected in other parts of the world like the UK, um, and so we do borrow their code of conduct. But they are endangered wild animals. So I don't see a lot of people jumping in the water with great white sharks, right, because that's a little scary for most folks. Just because basking sharks do not pose an apparent threat to us, just because we don't think they're dangerous, doesn't mean that we can't threaten them. Okay, so a lot of times when folks are in the water with sharks, um, the sharks will stop their feeding or stop their interactions with each other and swim away. And if this is the only time of year when sharks are coming to these locations to eat or to mate, then that could be really, really important. Um, that could be a really important time for them to have to do those behaviors. And so if you disrupt them, that might mean they have to go another year or expend more energy by not feeding, or maybe they don't get to reproduce or have pups that year because they've been interrupted. Um, and so it's really important when you're in the water with the basking sharks, um, if ever, you might not be, but if you are, please stay at least four meters away. So that's about 12 feet. Um, and if you are on a boat and you see a shark, um, please maintain 100, or 100 meter or 300 feet um, distance from the sharks and try to put your engines into neutral whenever you see wildlife at the surface generally that's good practice to have because you don't want to actually accidentally run a propeller through a wild animal um, but do try to maintain your distance and obviously if you're approached by a shark do try to just keep that distance if possible if you want more information on this we actually published a news piece on our website about the basking shark sightings in ireland recently but also outlining how we would like you all to socially distance from the sharks Now I can tell you all these things and learning about basking sharks is really, really cool. Um, but researchers are only a small piece of the puzzle when it comes to conservation and protecting the world's oceans generally. Um, and so how can you help? So I think that these guidelines are really interesting um, and useful, not only for basking sharks, but also for any sort of wildlife that you are passionate about protecting. First, I recommend that you be engaged, which you all are already doing by attending this webinar. Um, learn about the resources you have in your own backyard. So if you're in Ireland, maybe it's basking sharks and that's really cool. You should learn about them and learn when you might be able to see them. But maybe it's not basking sharks, maybe it's whales, maybe it's dolphins, maybe it's something on land. Um, so just learn about that as much as you can. Be a citizen scientist. So to be a researcher does not require any sort of degree. You can be a scientist just by paying attention to your surroundings, taking notes, reporting sightings of wildlife like basking sharks to the appropriate groups so that we have that data and know where those animals are. So you can contribute in a lot of ways, especially during this quarantine, um, just by paying attention to your surroundings. And finally, be active and informed. So if you feel strongly about conservation, you should make that heard. 
you should share what you know with people to whom it may or may not matter, right? So share it with parents, share it with friends, share it with family. That's what I do. And it's gotten me very far in terms of helping spread the right information about sharks, right? So I go back to what that image I showed you at the beginning of what a shark is. It's not all jaws, right? There's a lot of different types of sharks out there and they all play a really, really important role in making sure that our oceans are healthy. So with that, I will take any questions, but I will leave this up on the screen in case you want to learn more about basking sharks and you can follow the Irish Basking Shark Project on email, Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, and our website is a really, really incredible resource for learning about the species and what we're up to and the different projects. Um, but if you have questions for me in particular, my contact information is on the right. And that is all I have, I think, Jenny. Awesome, thank you so much, Alex. Um, Super interesting talk and I'm super excited myself to get involved with the Irish Basking and Shark Project. Um, can't wait to see where the research goes and, and what happens in the next few years. It's been pretty heartbreaking to see all the sightings that are happening on the West Coast and not being able to get there, um, yeah. which is a frustration that I know you understand. Um, we have a few questions, a few really cool questions coming through. If anyone has any questions that they haven't asked yet, just drop them off in the Q&A box and um, Alex will answer it live now. Um, and the first one is regarding, so Gregory asks, and I don't know if you know this because um, we're ecologists and we're not always evol evolutionary scientists, but do you know at what point in time Baskin sharks evolved their filter feeding um, and, and how they evolved it? That is a really incredible question. Um, it's one that I cannot give you a time for, but what I can tell you is that there are three filter feeding species of sharks and they all evolved independently. Um, and so I suspect that it might have something to do. So the reason that these sharks um, are so big, actually all the three filter feeders are the three biggest shark species. And it's because plankton is a constantly renewable energy source. So if you think about on land, a lot of the herbivores, the things that eat grass, can grow really big. And that's because there's a lot of grass around and it grows very quickly. And that's the same thing that's happening underwater. So a lot of the, the ocean's biggest animals um, are actually feeding on this constantly renewing source. So I suspect it has something to do with they were able to occupy a niche by feeding on plankton that other sharks were not. And then they were able to grow to a certain size. And then in order to maintain that size, they had to keep eating plankton. Um, but unfortunately, I cannot actually tell you how long ago that evolved, but I should look that up. That's a great question. Cool. Um, all right. So um, Kiefer then asks, um, do Baskin sharks only like cold water or do they also inhabit warmer waters? That's a really good question as well. So um, that's a question we consider a lot in light of ongoing environmental change because the sea surface temperatures are increasing. Um, they do tend to like colder water for sure. So they do reside in the temperate, the higher latitude regions. Um, they don't tend to go to warmer waters, but we do have data to suggest they are capable of going through warmer waters if necessary. Um, and so there are, there are places they tend to like to occupy and those are colder waters, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only place you would find them. Yeah. Um, all right. So um, lots of questions coming through. Um, we have one again, back to Gregory who asks, do Baskin sharks give birth to live young? Uh, and can you tell us a little bit about their reproduction? That's a great question. I don't, I think they are viviparous. They might be oviviparous. I think they are viviparous, Jenny. I don't know if you can confirm that. Um, so sharks generally have three different reproductive strategies. So they can be viviparous, which means give birth to live young. They can be oviviparous, which means that eggs hatch inside the mother, basically. Um, and then the young are produced from there, or they can lay eggs. Um, and a lot of the species that are pelagic, that travel throughout the open ocean, don't often have a place to put eggs. Um, and so they are either oviviparous or viviparous, so live bearing or close to live bearing. We don't know much about basking shark reproduction generally. Um, as far as I'm aware, I've actually only heard of two instances where juveniles have been found inside the mother, and they were both quite large, um, so like I think over a meter in length. Um, and so in both of those cases, they were, they were females that had been caught 
uh, and brought on board a boat or had washed up on shore. So actually one of those cases I just learned of last year when an ackle fisherman told me about it. Um, and so, but we don't know, you know, how long their gestation period is. So we think that maybe they could be pregnant for longer than a year probably, but we don't know how long. Um, and we don't necessarily know um, much about what happens to the juveniles after, after the basking sharks give birth. And, and do we know how long they live for? I've seen estimates of between 50 and 100 years, generally. Um, but yeah, so they are quite, quite late reproducing species. They have to get pretty big in order to start reproducing, so that can take over 10 years. Um, and so that's probably a big reason why we don't see the populations recovering in the way that we would like is because we need to wait a long time for the next population or next generation to start reproducing again. Um, and um, can they eat? So we talked a little bit about how they, they eat plankton, that's their food source, but um, are they capable of eating anything bigger than plankton? Mm, that's a great question. It's actually one that we have talked about when we've been out on the boat because we were sort of thinking, you know, these sharks just swim around with their mouths open. Like, how can they discriminate between like jellyfish and, you know, um, other things that might be in the water? So there, there's concern also that they might be ingesting plastic as well because they just can't regulate what they're eating. Their mouths are too big. Um, and so it's certainly possible that they are capable of ingesting larger items, but probably not intentionally, is, is what I would say. Yeah, and I, I know that in some, I think in some species of cetaceans, despite having really large mouths, their esophagus is actually quite small. So they yeah. can't actually fit anything bigger than uh, a fist, you know, fist size. So I don't know if that would be the, the same in Baskin sharks. Yeah, I think I have heard that it is quite like that. Their it's their sock is like the size of a, a a fist similarly, but I don't know. I don't. I've not dissected a shark, so I wouldn't be able to tell you for sure what's what's true there. Um. All right. So, um, talking about how endangered they are. Um. Obviously, we talked about how they've been fished a lot in the past. Um. Mm -hmm. But what about the future? How do you think climate change? might affect these Baskin sharks and especially their movements because that's something that you're very interested in. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. So I've been at, uh, up in Donegal at my field site for three years and I have actually seen very few sharks compared to what we would expect. I will also tell you that the sea surface temperature in Donegal for the last three years in the water has been three degrees or so higher than normal on some days, three degrees Celsius. So um, there, there is generally uh, the consensus that the sharks are tracking some sort of temperature. And so as the, the oceans warm, it's very possible that they will either go further offshore to stay a little bit cooler, so they won't be coming in as close to shore, um, or they might just travel further north. So we are seeing, and Jenny, you can probably attest to this, we are seeing a lot of more migratory, highly mobile animals moving further north because the temperatures are just becoming too hot in areas where they used to live. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are actually also seeing that happen with the prey that the basking sharks eat. So there's two populations of copepods and there's one that thrives at warm water and one that thrives at cold water. And we are seeing the cold water species moving north and we're also seeing the warm water species moving north. And so not only is the temperature itself changing, but it's driving changes in the prey of the basking sharks. So I expect um, we might start to see more sightings further north for sure. And that's right. And because Baskin sharks primarily, their movements are very much driven by their prey populations and following mm -hmm. where the prey goes. So we'll often find Baskin sharks where, um, on what we call ocean oceanographic, I can't say it, um, <laughs> from, yeah. um, where, so where this, um, these preys really thrive because of how much nutrient there are there. And so the, the Baskin sharks are found following those. So if those fronts move because um, climate change also creates um, changes in currents in the mm -hmm. oceans, not just temperature, and all of those things are going to affect the prey species yeah. that the basking sharks follow. So we're certainly, um, you know, it's certainly probably going to cause some changes in these basking sharks' behaviors and movements. 
Yeah, it's actually really interesting that you say that, Jenny, because a lot of people are like, you know, what role do basking sharks play in their ecosystems because they just feed directly on plankton? Um, I like to talk a lot about their role as being what we call climate indicators. And so because they follow plankton, which is going to be the first thing affected by climate change, um, if we see changes in basking shark movement patterns, that means that there is a problem at the base of the food web or the bottom of the food web is being more mobile. Um, and so changes in basking shark patterns are very tightly linked to changes in the environment. So I like to use them as like an indicator species. Great. Um, and so then we have a question um, uh, from, I can't find it anymore. Okay, so Kiefer asks, um, how many, um, how many pups, so we, we touched a bit on the, I'm coming back to reproduction, we touched a bit about um, the, the um, reproduction, but how, do we know how many adult Baskin sharks there are in the world? And do we know how many babies there are? And, and how do we know what, what their population is like? Great question. Uh, the, answer, the short answer is no, we don't know. Um, there have been very few genetic studies. There was one done, I believe, in the early 2000s and one done just last year. Um, estimating the population of basking sharks worldwide. Um, usually what these genetic studies are able to do is only estimate the number of breeding individuals because those are the ones contributing the genetics to the population, but that then excludes like baby sharks or older sharks that aren't reproducing anymore. Um, and so the paper last year suggested that some, based on some populations of sharks here or in the Northeast Atlantic, the population might be around 3,000 in the Northeast Atlantic of breeding -ish individuals. Um, and the global population estimate used to be 1,000 individuals. And so that's a big difference. And I think the answer generally is that we just don't really know. Um, and also I will say it's hard to tell because um, a lot of times the methods we would use would depend on reciting sharks year after year. And if you're starting to recite the same sharks, you might indicate, oh, I've seen as many as there are. Um, but unfortunately, we, we do go through years that I call shark drought years, um, where the sharks don't really show up in the numbers we would expect, like the last three years. But then you get years like this year, which is like a shark boom year, where we see a ton of them. And that's just normal basking shark behavior that's happened for centuries, as long as we've observed them. So it does make monitoring their populations kind of difficult. And speaking of those booms this year, we've been seeing really high number of reports this year. The, there's videos coming out from the west, west of Ireland with um, dozens of sharks in the water at once. Um, you just touched on how that can be quite usual. Um, is it is it more than we'd normally see in those boom years? What might be the reasons behind that? Great question. We, we've been getting this question a lot from different media outlets. Like, is it the pandemic? Is there less boat activity in the water? Is that what's driving the numbers of sharks in Ireland this year? I think the answer is not necessarily. I think uh, it's a combination of the sharks are just doing their normal, you know, activities by kind of showing up. Um, every, few, every few years, and they might stick around for the next few years as well, if records are um, any sort of indicator. But uh, I do think more people are also out looking for them. You know, people are at home right now, and they can only go, in Ireland, they can only go, what, like 5k from home? Yeah. So they can only go like three miles from their house. And so if they live on the coast, maybe they're just walking along the coast and paying attention more. Um, I don't necessarily think that it's like less boating activity because unlike whales and dolphins, which have to surface to feed and so might be affected by boating activity or to breathe, might be affected by boating activity, the sharks can dive. Um, and so they, they don't necessarily need to need to be at the surface at any point unless they're feeding. But I guess is that where less boat activity might play a role is that they're coming up to the surface more? Not that they wouldn't normally be there, oh, but they're coming up to the surface more. That's a good question, and I think the answer is potentially, right? Like maybe maybe there are fewer boats inter interfering with them feeding on plankton at the surface. Um, part of what I wanted to explore for my PhD is understanding what the sharks are doing when they are not at the surface. Um, and so I wanted to know, you know, if they're in the area, what if we just aren't seeing them? And that could really affect how many basking sharks we think there are in the world. So we really don't know much about what they're doing when they are not at the surface. Cool. 
Um, so there's, so what we're learning from this is that there's a, a lot of un unanswered questions out there, um, be it about Bersken sharks, but we've certainly seen it in our previous uh, webinars. We've got, had a lot of uh, people on saying, we just don't know this yet. We are looking into it. And so um, a lot of the people watching us might be quite young or looking in to get it into to research and conservation. What is your advice for um, for them uh, on how to get into the field and what to do. Um, maybe they're still really young and so what can they do to prepare their, their, to prepare for this the best? Absolutely. Well, the fact that they're already watching these webinars is a great first step. Um, I will say like I grew up in Ohio. I did not have access to the ocean growing up at all. So Ohio is in the middle of the United States for those of you who do not know. Um, and I think I just spent a lot of time learning about how to observe the environment. So I spent a lot of time in the outdoors just watching. Um, and that was a skill that I then used later on when I was on the water. Um, but also I read, I read a lot. I like, I, I think that the best way to learn is to listen to other communicators. Um, and then I became involved in things like working at my local aquarium. Um, I wasn't afraid to ask questions. So like, for example, after today, if any of you guys have questions, you should email me. It's never a waste of my time to answer your questions, no matter how old you are. Um, because the more informed the next generation of scientists is, um, the, the easier it is for them to continue work that we are trying to do now. Um, and so I think reading about sharks or marine biology in general, asking people questions about what it's like to be a marine biologist is a really good thing. Um, because I think you would be surprised at the different journeys that we all take to becoming this. Um, so, so just taking the time to learn about sharks, you know, watch them on TV, on documentaries if you have to, although be very careful with what those documentaries are saying sometimes. Um, you know, just learn about them as much as you can through whatever, whatever resources you have available. If you're at the beach, that's awesome. If you can get in the water, that's amazing, but you don't have to. Um, and so I think that it's important to know that there are resources available, especially online, especially during a time like the pandemic for you to learn more. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, we, we have had multiple different, uh, um, we've had so many different people that have all had different ways to get into where they are now. Um, and so it's such a really been a, such a great opportunity for young people to see that, you know, you might live in the middle of um, land with no sea and it doesn't matter. You can still get to, to study sharks or the oceans. Um, and yeah, definitely asking questions is one of the, the biggest ways that you can get involved. Um, and so last question. That's it. Quick fire question. What's your favorite shark? Oh, I think I know who asked this question also. I love basking sharks. I love poor Jackson sharks. I think they are adorable. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say. If you don't know what they look like, you should go look them up. The, the babies are the cutest. And I helped raise baby poor Jackson sharks at the aquarium when I worked there. So that would be my answer. But I love basking sharks. They are very close second, obviously. Yeah. And every other shark is close third, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right. Well, thank you so much, Alex. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, if you have any more questions uh, about Baskin Sharks, uh, you can email um, Alex, but you can also drop us a message on our social media. You can visit our website, which have a lot of fact sheets on there. We're constantly updating, adding information onto it. So keep going onto our website. There's videos, there's coloring sheets, there's fact sheets, there's everything you might want. Um, and we're adding activities very soon and we're going to be running contests. So stay updated, follow us on our social media, um, sharksforkids.com is our website and you'll find all the information there. And Alex's um, webinar will be up on YouTube very soon. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks when we'll have a new webinar um, planned. Okay. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, yeah, thank you, Jenny. Awesome.